Hello everyone, good afternoon. For Telesur, I'm Cody Weddle in Caracas, Venezuela. To begin today, the Brazilian Supreme Court will issue a key ruling on the impeachment process against President Dilma Rousseff. Now, the Supreme Court halted last week an impeachment process against Rousseff launched in Brazil's lower house due to possible irregularities. The court will decide now how the impeachment process should be carried, to, carried out to avoid unconstitutional procedures. Meanwhile, dozens of social movements and political organizations are marching in Brazil in support of President Dilma Rousseff ahead of the Supreme Court's ruling. The supporters of President Dilma have declared a national day against impeachment and aim to influence the court's crucial vote by showing the popular support still enjoyed by the president. And still in Brazil, President Rousseff inaugurated the first National Conference of Indigenous Policies. Rousseff signed a decree creating a National Council of Indigenous Policies with the aim of helping indigenous uh, communities in regaining their rights. Now, the conference is being attended by over 2,000 delegates representing all of Brazil's indigenous communities. And in Colombia now, representatives of victims' organizations have welcomed the last agreement on victims and justice subscribed by the FARC and the government in Havana, Cuba. The deal has been held as a major step towards peace construction and reconciliation in the country. Our correspondent Natalia Margarita now reports from Bogota. Ten victims were witnesses of the latest agreement signed by the FARC and the Colombian government in Cuba, a deal that commits the parties to truth, compensation and guarantees of non-repetition for the estimated 7 million victims that Colombia's armed conflict has left. We are going to get to know the reality of these nearly 60 years of armed conflict and confrontation, and in what way many actors have played a role in that. And that's what we expect to know, the truth. We believe that knowing the truth is the key to advance on the principles of non-repetition and justice. The agreement establishes the creation of a special jurisdiction for peace, a special unit for the search of the disappeared, and a commission for the clarification of the truth, mechanisms that have been designed to comply with the rights and demands of the victims, among which the truth and responsibilities are central. Many different parties have been involved in the victimization of Colombian citizens, but now we are beginning to see concrete measures to hold accountable all of those, whether through direct or indirect action, hold responsibility for what happened. Victims such as Olga, who was forcibly displaced by paramilitaries 15 years ago, sees with hope that beyond the clarification of the truth and acknowledgement of responsibilities, the agreement also contemplates compensation according to the damages that the victims have suffered. We displaced people are usually peasants who are rooted to our lands. Thus, I believe that the best compensation for us is to be able to go back to our parcels, work the land, and reap the harvest, having a right to life granted, and that is implied in the agreement. Victims and social activists are well aware that the big challenge now is to guarantee that the latest deal on victims, as well as the other three previous agreements that have been reached in Havana, get successfully implemented in Colombia. Natalia Margarita, Telesur, Bogotá. In a historic ruling, the International Court of Justice defined the border between Costa Rica and Nicaragua. Now, this case, which dates back to 2010, it's based on a territorial dispute over Calero Island, a swath of land in Costa Rica's Atlantic coast, which borders the San Juan River. Nicaragua claimed the land was theirs, but the ICJ ruled in favor of Costa Rica. The court has concluded that the right margin of the canal dug by Nicaragua in the year 2010 is not a part of the Costa Rican-Nicaraguan border and that the territory under Costa Rican sovereignty extends from the right basin of the lower San Juan River up to its exit in the Caribbean Sea. Sovereignty over the disputed territory therefore belongs to Costa Rica. Hundreds of workers took to the streets of Caracas to, Caracas to protest against the political opposition's in, in, intention of privatizing the state-owned CAN-TV telephone company. 
President Nicolas Maduro greeted the crowd and promised that the opposition would not be allowed to rule the country based on their majority in parliament. Maduro describes this strategy as an electoral coup as the opposition has announced it will try to revert strategical nationalizations in some key sectors. Don't believe that it will stay like this. No, it won't stay like this. We're going to change this situation and we will not allow the right to consolidate its electoral coup. So I say, we will not allow it, that the right achieved consolidate its fascist electoral coup. To Argentina now, where the Mauricio Macri administration has given uh, interference, uh, its grave interference in the judiciary is causing some vast popular outrage there. President Mauricio Macri on Monday appointed two new acting Supreme Court justices without obtaining approval from the Senate and taking advantage of the fact that Congress is in summer recess. Now the maneuver has been harshly criticized and rejected by some diverse political and social sectors of that country and even within the, the governing uh, Let's Change coalition. Right-wing President Mauricio Macri surprised everyone after appointing two new justices to Argentina's highest court of law through an executive order and without approval from the Senate. The appointments seek to cover two vacancies at the Supreme Court. Macri's excuse to abruptly fill the vacancies is that, according to him, a fully operational tribunal is urgently required. Many have criticised Macri's timing, saying that he is taking advantage of the fact that Congress is closed for the summer. What we have is a manoeuvre that threatens the entire judiciary. Necessity and urgency decrees are for times of necessity and urgency, and they were not placed in the Constitution to shut down the voice of the federal parliament. Article 99, Section 19 of Argentina's Constitution notes that the President may fill vacancies that would otherwise require the Senate's approval when Congress is in recess. No democratically elected president has ever made full use of this mechanism. President Macri has the powers to summon parliamentary sessions over the summer break, but has chosen not to and has not explained why. We are being victims of a very strong incitement, and these challenges are the type that encourage the spirit to come out and question them. We must defend all our country's democracy. The longest stretch of democratic rule in our nation's history, from dying, from faltering, and we must not settle down and think that this will just go away. This is not the first time that the right-wing Macri government seeks to blatantly interfere in the judiciary. Since its electoral win in November, it has threatened to remove Argentina's Attorney General, Alejandra Gil Carbó. In a despicable example of ideological harassment, the new government accuses the Attorney General, who has a glowing track record of being an unbiased front-for-victory militant, despite the fact that she was approved by both FPV and right-wing senators. They're not only after me. It would be useless to tie me up and take away my authority. Because next to me are hundreds of public prosecutors, public servants, workers of the Public Prosecutions Ministry, who have all worked hard all these years to break an old stagnant culture, which was full of red tape. They've become proactive and committed to matters of human rights, the human rights of the past and the future. Mauricio Macri's presidency has started off aggressively, to say the very least. Hours before taking the oath, he filed an eccentric court injunction to terminate Cristina Fernandez's term 12 hours prematurely, which was approved, triggering the need for an interim president for half a day. In his first 72 hours at the helm, he completely bypassed Parliament and signed a whopping 29 decrees, violating the independence of several public institutions. But the brand new president's authoritarianism did not end there. Mauricio Macri's decision to appoint two justices for Argentina's highest tribunal by decree on only his second working day as head of state has caused outrage. Even though the constitution allows it, no democratically elected president has ever dared to skip the Senate and single-handedly name Supreme Court justices. Mauricio Macri joins a long list of some of Argentina's most ruthless dictators in doing so. 
Leo Espolete Caduti, Telesur, Buenos Aires. For more analysis now, we go to uh, Argentina. I understand we have an economist, an analyst. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who that is. I believe his name is Mr. Dr. Sibyls. Uh, hello there. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. I'm sorry. I didn't get the information on uh, who we would be talking to. Can I just have you introduce yourself? Yes. Good afternoon. I am Alan Sibyls, uh, uh, an economist and professor at uh, local public university here. All right. Thanks so much uh, for that. Uh, to begin, I want to ask you, uh, we have heard a lot about Mauricio Macri, the new president there, uh, his plans to end export and import taxes. How far reaching will that be and to what extent will that uh, policy change impact Argentina's economy? Well, um, it, it yet remains to be seen what the impact of these uh, decisions uh, will be. The, the truth is um, Argentina's uh, export taxes on some of its uh, agricultural production primary products had become uh, sort of outdated given the drop, the, the drop in international uh, commodity prices that has happened over recent years, and also given the um, what one could say inconsistencies in the management of the exchange rates and the inflation locally. Uh, so it, it yet remains to be seen. Uh, one would hope that that would induce uh, a higher production of wheat, for example, which is uh, has dropped off very substantially uh, in recent years. However, it is also probable that the lifting of these taxes will result, actually it has already happened domestically on some products, will result in higher prices and therefore contributing in a way to the uh, inflationary situation here. So one could say it is a mixed bag. But perhaps the most uh, troubling uh, element of, of uh, the upcoming uh, economic policy package and framework is that is Macri's orientation towards uh, what is euphemistically called or are euphemistically called market-friendly uh, policies. In other words, policies that tend to favor uh, corporations and especially foreign corporations and not so much focused on domestic development, uh, production and uh, employment. So this of course remains to be seen, but uh, everything that has been talked about so far strongly points in that direction. Today, uh, no, we've seen different reports in, uh, since October of prices uh, rising in Argentina. What, what do you think we can expect in terms of inflation and the cost of living for Argentinians, uh, especially after the government announced that uh, it plans to cut some key subsidies? Yes, well, uh, Argentina has had uh, moderate inflation, moderate to high inflation, depends on how one defines that, but now since 2007. So this is a process that has been ongoing for many years. We've had uh, roughly between 20 and 30 percent, depending on the year, inflation annually. Um, since October, there has been a fairly strong increase in some of the prices, uh, namely wheat uh, prices and all uh, products that use wheat flour, bread, etc., uh, and beef. Uh, clearly, uh, producers uh, were, or pro not so much producers, but the intermediary sectors, uh, is, is the sort of the processing plants, uh, anticipated the fact that uh, uh, export taxes were going to be lifted, and so they uh, started to increase prices. The, the, however, the price increases are not throughout the economy, but uh, tend to be more focused on these specific uh, products, which I think um, uh, sort of are reflecting the, the, the knowledge that, that the taxes were going to be lifted. 
Now, what's going to happen in the future, um, it's unclear, but I think more worrisome than the lifting of the export taxes or the reduction in some cases is the fact that we're moving to a freely floating exchange rate, which will probably be announced in the next couple of hours here. And not only is um, the exchange rate going to float, but it, the initial value of foreign currencies, the dollar mainly, is going to be substantially devalued compared to what it has been up to now, at least the official rate. So I think that devaluation uh, is going to probably uh, reflect, uh, be reflected in increased prices in the, in the upcoming days and weeks. So this is troublesome because um, we have a fairly good reason to believe that uh, the adjustment process in Argentina is going to come via workers' wages. Uh, so uh, the way to sort of deal with the inflationary impact of the devaluation is going to be to curtail consumption and induce uh, austerity uh, through that uh, through that process, so um, one can anticipate that uh, purchasing power of people on fixed income is going to uh, suffer, and one could also anticipate that social conflict as a result is going to increase unions and other social organizations which have a fairly high level of mobilization in Argentina. Uh, so one could expect uh, a context of greater social protest and conflict uh, in upcoming months. Right, uh, Dr. Alan Sibbles there for some analysis uh, as we learn more about uh, the latest policies that are being supported and implemented by the new president there, Mauricio Macri. Thank you so much. Moving on now, uh, the ongoing civil war in Syria has seen the deaths and displacement of many of its civilians. Now with the involvement of other world powers, will the war finally possibly come to an end? We'll uh, be talking more about the conflict in Syria when we return. Caracas, Havana, Mexico, Quito, Washington, wherever the newsmakers will be there. From watch on TV.net slash English, Telesur, wherever the news, you'll be there. Rod Stars, G1, and Claudia De La Cruz are Rebel Diaz, hip-hop activists positioned within a history of political resistance through music. And you don't stop. They invite young people to express themselves about their social struggles. And you don't stop. Watch it on TV.net slash English. English, tell us, sir, wherever the news, you'll be there. From London, an interpretation of current world politics as presented by the activist, writer, and historian Tariq Ali. The emergence of the United States as a global empire. The world today, only on TV.net in English. Wherever the news, you'll be there. No agreement for peace if President Bashar al-Assad stays in power in Syria. That's what the Syrian opposition is saying now. Now, that revelation comes before new peace talks between the warring factions are set to take place in New York on Friday. According to the Syrian National Council, the battle against terrorism carried out by Russia and the U.S. will not be enough. To them, the issue is President Bashar al-Assad. Now, the opposition coalition has not been officially invited to those talks, but they express their views and opinions. After Turkey repositioned recently deployed troops in Iraq on Monday, the country's parliament has asked Turkey to fully withdraw its troops from Iraq. The area of Mosul has been under control of the self-proclaimed Islamic State group since the summer of 2014. Now, according to Turkey, their initial batch of troops were sent there as part of a training mission and to help Iraq combat extremism. However, experts say that Turkey's real aim is to fight against its rival, the Kurdistan Workers' Party. 
The deployment of Turkish troops around Mosul was never authorized by Baghdad, which sparked tensions between both nations. Two Palestinians were shot dead by Israeli security forces during an arrest raid in the occupied West Bank on Wednesday. Now, according to Israeli police, the victims tried to ram the security forces with their cars during the raid in two separate incidents. Three soldiers were reportedly injured. The news was confirmed by both Israeli and Palestinian officials. The current refugee crisis in Europe has been widely uh, reported and undoubtedly has taken a toll on the EU and the refugees themselves. Now reports have surfaced that the European Commission has ordered Italy to use force, if necessary, to compel migrants and refugees to have their fingerprints taken there. Uh, this in turn would allow the refugees and migrants to apply for asylum in Italy rather than move on to the richer countries of Northern Europe. North Korea's highest court has sentenced a Canadian Christian pastor to a life term of hard labor for crimes against the state, as they're calling him. The Toronto-based pastor, who was born in South Korea, was shown at a news conference confessing to a, to a plot to overthrow the government and set up a religious state. The pastor was also accused of funding and helping defectors to escape the country. Cuban baseball stars Yaciel Puig and Jose Abreu returned home on Tuesday for the first time since defecting to play in America. Now this was as part of an unprecedented Major League Baseball tour made possible by the improvement in U.S.-Cuban relations. Both stars returned with an MLB delegation that will host workshops and meet with Cuban baseball officials on a four-day tour of the island. Traditional Mexican music called Veracruz and uh, Son Jarocho is uh, entertaining different generations there. Now here is a sneak peek now from our very own in-house show, Cultura Latina, that explores uh, this unique music. taste of traditional music with the Veracruz and Son Jarocho music that keeps entertaining different generations among other modern beats. Son Jarocho is the most traditional rhythm from the state of Veracruz in Mexico, made from harp, jarana, the requinto and the quijada, among other ancient instruments. The Caña Dulce Caña Brava group is one of the finest exponents of this genre, with a strong conviction of promoting women's feelings, social struggles and gender equality through music and cultural expression. All this and more this week in Cultura Latina. That's what we're covering today. Plenty more on all of those stories and others. Uh, check out our website, telesertv.net slash English. Join us on social media as well, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Cody Wada. We'll have the latest news for you in just a few hours.